Our first lesson for this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and then continuing in verses 6 through 9. So listen for what the Holy Spirit is telling God's people. So now Israel, just or, so now Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it. But keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them and perform them, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourself closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Our second lesson this morning comes from the letter of James, chapter 1, starting at verse 70, 17 and concluding with verse 27. So listen once more for the word of God. Every gener generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of, or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave birth to us by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror for they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be a blessing, be, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one's self unstained by the world. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Well, you, you all know that I graduated from Columbia Theological Seminary several years ago. Um, and during my time there uh, with Gretchen and the boys, we were involved with Central Presbyterian Church, which is located in downtown Atlanta. It sits directly across from the state capitol building. The front doors of the church and the capitol stare at one another every single day. 
And Central was, was and is a, a large urban church. It's right in downtown. And its membership was and still is spread out across the Atlanta area all over the place. And because Central Presbyterian Church is a downtown community in, a, in downtown Atlanta, there are particular challenges that that church faces that are unique to its own situation and context. For one, nobody, nobody, nobody lives next to the church. Nobody lives there. Everyone is making their commute into the building and away from the building whenever they want to do any kind of church activities or church programming. So whether it's Sunday school or worship or choir practice or service activities or, or whatever, everyone is commuting in and commuting back. And so the church is left trying to figure out some stuff, right? They're left trying to figure out how to grow their community and how to, how to foster unity amongst this membership that's scattered here and there and, and everywhere. That's one of the challenges that's unique to them. But that's not the only challenge, right? All churches have, have myriad challenges out there, and Central Presbyterian is, is no different. They are also left trying to figure out how to deal with the many issues that they are facing in their own urban center. Not unlike us, we're trying to figure out how to address the, uh, our, the challenges that we're facing here in our own rural-ish sort of context, our small town center. They're trying to figure out, though, how to, how to meet the needs of their particular community, as, as many churches do. And, and for them, this particular con congregation in this particular place, it means addressing the many issues surrounding homelessness. That's of central importance to them. It's one of the big challenges they face. So they're dealing with and learning about race equity and poverty and food insecurity and joblessness and homelessness and mental illness, all of these things, just to name a few. They have their fingers in all sorts of conversations because they're trying to figure out how best to help Atlanta's unhoused population. And on any given Sunday, on any, any given Sunday, as people made their way into the church building, if you didn't park in the underground parking gar garage and parked on the streets, you would, you would encounter men and women all over the place lining the streets around the church. And I'll be honest with you, I'll be honest with you, these were, these were friendly people. They were friendly people. They would greet you as you walked into the building and as people made their way to the church, they would wish you well, they would say hi. They were, they were friendly, friendly people. We usually parked in the underground parking garage, but when we parked on the streets, we, would, we were not asked for money. Not a single time in my four years there, I was never asked for money. I was never asked for food. I was never asked for any type of assistance. I was just greeted warmly by these folks. It wasn't why they were there. They weren't there to ask us for things. They were simply there, I think, because this was their gathering with their people, their community. They were meeting together, spending time with, with their friends. And some of them, some of these men and women, they, they became involved to some degree or another at Central. They would come to worship regularly on Sunday mornings, a few of them. But every once in a while, every once in a while something strange would happen when we gathered for worship on a Sunday morning. Something would, would disrupt our regular patterns of worship. Something would just jar us out of our normal, comfortable, weekly rhythm of, of life and love and worship. One particular Sunday, I remember, I remember it well, the pastor stood up uh, giving those welcoming addresses and announcements, trying to situate people and invite them into the service. And, and this one unhoused man stood up and he made his way down the aisle toward the front of the sanctuary. And he began to speak to the pastor as he gave his welcome and announcements. And he pleaded with the pastor for some help. He pleaded with the pastor for some food. 
in particular. He it was clear that he was in need of something to eat. And I think about that, and, and I just wonder some things. I wonder, I wonder what you would do in that situation. Man walks down the center aisle here. I wonder what I would do in that situation, or what we would do as a family of faith. If somebody came in through those doors right there, and walked down, and interrupted the pastor, what would we do if we were confronted with this kind of situation right here and right now? And you know, I'm, I'm sure that on that particular day, I'm sure that on that particular day in that particular sanctuary, I bet that there were number, any number of people thinking any number of things in that moment. I'm sure that there were a few people in that congregation, or I'd if I were a betting man, I'd put money on it, right? That there were a couple people in there that just wanted to call the cops to come in and get this guy out of there. I imagine that there were people in that congregation who, who wanted to get up in that moment and run downstairs to the kitchen, uh, grab that guy some food and send him on his way. I imagine there were some people who just wanted him to, to sit down and zip it so that they could get back to what they were there to do, to worship, to go through the comforting rhythms of, of their normal weekly routine. You know, any number of things, any number of things could have happened that day. People could have thought all sorts of stuff about that moment, but, but I'll tell you what did happen that day. So the man came up, the pastor stopped giving those announcements. And he listened to that man for a short period of time. And then he offered a, a brief prayer for him, telling him why we were here as a body and praying for him in his own particular situation. And then he did something that I didn't expect him to do. Pastor introduced him to a man who was sitting toward the front of the sanctuary. It just happened to be the clerk of session. And the two of them, the clerk of session and this unhoused man, kind of walked back and they sat down together in the pew. And they worshiped for the rest of the service. And then following worship, clerk of session and that man walked down together and they ate lunch in the fellowship hall. You know, I think about that. It takes a lot of dedication takes a lot of being willing to step into uncomfortable and messy places. It takes a lot of effort maybe and planning to be ready for what might happen. But it was also this wonderful, wonderful, beautiful expression of what, of what I think James is trying to say to us and to others as well in the introduction of this letter. Because if there's anything that James knew, he knew all too well that there was a debate raging amongst early Christ followers. A debate about faith. A debate about trust. A debate about belief. And, and it's a debate that still persists today, on and on and on in our own time and age. Because what they're really arguing about is the essence of belief. Belief has become associated with what we think about things or what we say about those things we think about. We've relegated belief to some spiritual, otherly, worldly, moral matters. But James says, uh-uh. He says, no. That's not good enough. That is wrong, in fact. James says we have been given the gift of God's perfect law. The perfect gift from the perfect gift giver. And therefore, therefore we must be doers of the law. We must be doers of God's gift. We must be doers of God's good word. You see, James, he is concerned He's concerned with getting people out of their comfort zones, breaking down those normal rhythms so that people might start getting their hands dirty in the messiness 
and the discomfort of sin in people's lives. Yeah, he's concerned with us getting out there. According to James, it's not seeing that's believing. It's not thinking that demonstrates our faith. It's not speaking about what we conceive the world to be. None of that is what is important for James. According to James, acting in the world is our call of faith. Making things happen is the expression of our trust in God and God's plan for us. For James, the essence of faith is this. It is that doing is believing. I mean, just look at what he says in his letter. Everything that James has to say in the introduction to this epistle summons his readers to do stuff, to do stuff. He asks them to listen carefully. He tells them to refrain from asserting our desires into things. He tells us to set aside our anger He tells us to discipline ourselves so as to avoid unhealthy habits. And he calls us to care for those in need, all of the orphans and the widows and others. All of these things, all of these things he asks us to do are our acts of faith, according to James. Because for James, doing is believing. That may be true. And this may come as a surprise to you. You may be quite shocked by this. Wilkes County, not the same kind of place as downtown Atlanta. We're not the same kind of people as Central Presbyterian Church. We don't need to be like them in every respect. We don't need to do the same things that they are doing. We don't need to try to be like Big Brother. Our issues are not their issues, necessarily. But I do think this morning, James has something to say to the both of us. James is begging us, begging us to open our eyes to our community and to get to work, to get our hands dirty in the messiness of life. James is pleading with us and and them, pleading with us to act faithfully in our own community. James is summoning us to show, to show that we believe in a loving God, to show that we believe in a loving God by doing the work that needs to be done here within these walls and beyond. So the real question for us, the real question that James leaves us with is this. How are you? How am I? How are, how are we going to get our hands dirty in Wilkes this week? Amen. And now, friends, we go. We go out into the world that God so dearly and deeply loves. We go out into a world that needs God's love and grace. We go as people who believe in a gracious and loving God, but we believe that by doing it, by going out and being doers of God's love, by going out and being sharers of God's grace by going out and being the builders of peace and justice that God has asked us to be. So go. Go and be a doer of your faith, and as you go, I pray you go with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ, may the love of God our Creator, and may the partnership of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, may that God go with you and with me and with us together this day and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.